Uh, so we're just going to do a quick lecture on kind of high level differential expression concepts, and then we'll pivot right back into continuing the practical exercises. So as I'm sure most of you already know, um, the idea of differential expression is really trying to take the dream expression or abundance estimates that we're generating and tie them back in some way to genotype or phenotype. Um, we're usually asking questions like which genes or transcripts are being expressed at higher or lower levels in different groups of samples. And are these differences significant uh, where we're trying to account for things like variance and noise in the data. And there's, of course, like an infinite number of examples of kinds of differential expression questions you could ask. In this course, we're asking, are the UHR cells different than HBR brain cells? Are the HCC 1395 tumor cell line uh, samples different from the normals um, in one of the, or maybe both of the team or practical or integrate assignments, rather, we're asking, are the wild type cells different from like the knockout cells or shRNA knockdown cells. So these are the kind of simple comparisons we've set up for you. You may have similar or more complicated experiments or, or questions in your own research, but the general idea, I think, of differential expression applies. Uh, we're using, among other approaches, a package called ball gown. Um, so just to quickly introduce the idea of that, I think you guys actually already ran this last night. That was the last thing that we did. Uh, and this uses a parametric F test. Um, and it's kind of a more complicated statistic than a lot of approaches where it's actually comparing two different um, models. So what it does is uh, it fits two models to each feature where feature is like the gene or transcript using expression as the outcome, and then one including the covariate of interest, so like tumor versus normal or HBR versus UHR, and one without including that covariate of interest. And then it calculates an F statistic and a p-value uh, using the fits of these two different models, and it determines significance if um, the model that includes the covariate of interest fits significantly better than the model without the covariate. Um, this is just kind of like a complicated way of doing effectively like the equivalent of like a Wilcox test or a t-test or something. It's really just asking like, is the the values for your gene significantly different between condition A and condition B? And then like many approaches, it adjusts for multiple testing by reporting Q values, um, which is uh, by default uh, at a false discovery rate um, of 5%. Ballgown also comes with a bunch of visualizations. I don't think we've looked at these yet, so we'll probably do that today. Um, so that's one of the reasons we've included this package is that it like allows you to quite quickly get to some some nice visualizations, especially um, these like transcript level um, visualizations that might be a little bit of work to produce um, on your own. So it can show you like not only expression levels of the genes overall, but also of the individual transcript levels. And you can kind of get a sense like, oh, okay, this particular isoform with this structure seems to be more highly expressed and explaining most of the expression from the gene locus for this particular gene. But there are lots of other approaches and we're gonna cover at least one or two of them. Uh, the kind of conceptually biggest alternate approach is to use raw counts instead of these like kind of complicated um, TPM values that are derived from, from string tie. <laughs> so we're gonna show an example of how to do differential expression based on those raw counts uh, using edge R instead of um, using the string tie uh, TPM type approach. So a common question is, which one should I use? Um, considering between the FPKM TPM style expression, differential expression versus the raw count approach. Uh, this is really a, a long running um, debate, but I think the general consensus is that 
when you want to, to leverage the benefits of something like the tuxedo suite. So that's what this set of programs we're using is called the um, like string tie ball gown uh, approach. That's part of the tuxedo suite. If you want to get that like isoform level discovery and the visualizations, that would be one argument for using the, the more complicated normalized TPMs that you get from, from string time. But it's also good for visualization. So when you're making heat maps, it definitely works better to use like a, a normalized value like FPKM or TPM than to try to directly visualize the raw counts. The raw counts are, I would say, less useful for visualization because they haven't been normalized in any way. Um, for things like calculating fold change, it can also be prefer preferable to use the TPM type values. People like to use the counts primarily for the statistical methods that are available for differential expression. So there are some very robust packages that have like been shown to have very good performance of really identifying the true differentially expressed genes. Uh, and they, there are also some packages that allow for more complex, sophistic, more sophisticated experimental designs. So like maybe you did like a time series or you have like five different conditions that you want to compare in some complicated way, like in a multivariate model or something like that. I feel like there's a lot more um, sophisticated statistical approaches you can apply to the raw counts with some of the packages that are available. Whereas with the, like the string tie ball gown type approach, you get probably what is a very well thought out statistical approach, but it's, um, it's kind of like you get what they what they give you. There's not a lot of configuration in terms of how you can set it up. And in general, multiple approaches are advisable. So we basically always do both count based and FPKM TPM style. Um, this is a plot we made a little while ago uh, running cuff diff, which was the predecessor to ball gown. Um, and edge R, which we're going to run in another package called DEC. And you can see, so this is looking at the a Venn diagram of the overlap between the genes that were found to be significantly differentially expressed using these three different approaches. And there's a pretty substantial overlap, but there's also a lot that are unique to just two out of three of the approaches or even one out of three of the approaches. So depending on what your downstream goals are, um, if you do maybe two different approaches or three different approaches, you have some options, right? So you could say, I'm gonna just focus on the most arguably kind of robust um, genes that were identified by two or all three approaches. Those are probably really differentially expressed. Uh, or maybe you wanna be more comprehensive. Maybe you really don't wanna miss anything and you, you wanna take like the union of all of them. So any gene that was identified by any one approach um, could be considered important or something in between. So that's kind of why we're trying to introduce you to at least a couple of different options. Lessons learned from the microarray days. You guys probably don't even remember what microarrays are at this point, but before we had RNA-seq, we had microarrays. Um, and when I was doing my PhD, this is what a lot of it was based on. Um, and there was a long period where this was like, I would say, a highly relevant slide because there were some lessons learned from the microarray days that were really being ignored, I would say, in RNA-seq experiments. It's much, much better now. So I feel like we're kind of past this phase. But you should think about doing power analysis for your RNA-seq experiments. So... Um, just because you have like a great technology like RNA-seq, it does not remove the need for biological replicates and for good study design. And, you know, there were sort of like hundreds of early RNA-seq papers where you were seeing like comparisons of like literally N equals one to N equals one. It's kind of like what you have now with single cell RNA actually, or what you've had for the last few years where because of the cost and the complexity of this new approach, and wanting to kind of understand how it works. There's a lot of excitement and there's, you know, how many papers have we seen the last two years with like one sample with 500 cells being compared to another sample with 300 cells and like pretty sweeping biological conclusions being made. 
that's probably not, not a good idea, just like it wasn't a good idea to do like an N of one versus N of one RNA-seq. We're doing an N of three versus N of three here for like practical reasons, right? Because it would be a hassle for you guys to type out or copy paste like 50 commands. <clears throat> but in most cases, you, you should probably be doing, you know, larger sample sets, more replicates. Although there may be cases where three is sufficient. Uh, multiple testing correction is also extremely important, more important than ever, really. So um, when we had microarrays uh, for a long time, there was sort of like 20 or 30,000 genes on the array. Um, and then we started getting like exon level or transcript level arrays that had maybe hundreds of thousands of features being measured um, by the microarray. But with RNA-seq, you have like a near infinite number of features. It sort of depends on how you define them. You have basically all of the genes, um, all of their possible isoforms, their introns, which can be expressed at some level, uh, novel exon-exon junctions that are being expressed at some level, either because of the sort of noisiness of um, the splicing machinery or because there are legitimately novel alternative splicing events happening all the time. Um, <clears throat> you can look at the data from so many different levels, like you can do exon by exon comparisons. You can look now for other kinds of RNA species that you wouldn't have been able to before, right? So like microRNAs or link RNAs or other kinds of um, RNAs. And as a result, we have like millions or tens of millions or hundreds of millions of features, right? So if you start doing all these comparisons between all those features, you're going to get significant results that are just by random chance um, that are mostly spurious. So you need to like think about what question you're asking about maybe doing feature reduction and then certainly doing uh, multiple test correction. And then we come to downstream interpretation of expression analysis. So this is really a <clears throat> topic for an entire course. Um, the expression estimates and the differential expression list that we're getting from string tie and ball gown or some of the other approaches like HTC and EDGAR can be fed into many downstream analyses, right? Um, you could do, you know, clustering and visualize that with heat maps. Some of that is provided by ball gown. And we also provide some kind of old school art uh, code to, to do those kind of visualizations. You might do classification analysis where you're trying to develop like a model that, or a biomarker that predicts outcome or predicts prognosis or something. Um, you might want to do pathway analysis and dot, dot, dot. There's many other kinds of analyses you could do. So we're going to cover some of these, um, but certainly not all of them. So just to reorient you um, for where we are, we have at this point got our raw data. We've done alignments with HiSat. We've done uh, transcript compilation and estimation with string tie. Uh, and then we've done differential expression um, with ball gown. And we're going to kind of just pick up there. We're going to finish that module, which had just a little bit left, and then start looking at ball gown um, visualizations and then doing um, other kinds of differential expression statistics and visualizations. <clears throat> 